Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Purpose Tune podcast. The goal of my show is to create valuable content to broaden your knowledge, inspire you, and get you in the right mindset so you can apply it in your own life to drive impact, generate meaning, and achieve your purpose. Now, today's guest is Hillary Rice. She is a creative director, positioning coach, and founder of Statement Peace Studio. She's also the co host of the cult favorite YouTube marketing talk show, Hillary and Margot Yell at websites, and has had her work featured on Business Insider, The Next Web, The Observer, and more. Since 2011, she's helped thousands of brands all over the world get seen and heard, and also make serious cash through her one-on-one client work, writing, coaching, and videos. Nowadays, she's on a mission to help more small businesses define their statement piece, also known as the bold point of view that makes them radically relevant to their perfect people. Hillary, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I am fantastic today and I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, me too. I'm excited to have you on. Um, so tell us more about your your work uh, aside from what I've read so far. Yes, absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I am a something what's called a, I'm a creative director, which is a label I think a lot of people in the brand space and ad space will recognize. Uh, but I'm also a positioning coach, and my positioning coaching is the bulk of what I do. It's something that I really love, and what I do day to day in my business is help uh, creative service providers and online business owners find the focal point of their brand and their most powerful positioning in the market, hence power position, right? So every day I get to jam with copywriters, designers, coaches, consultants, um, mar- digital marketers of all stripes to really develop a core focus for their brand that combines their specialty, you know, what do they really want to focus on, their unique approach, not just what they do so magically well, but how and turn that into offers, content strategy, concepts that are really going to help them carve out their own corner uh, in the marketplace. And it's really such a joy because what I also get to do uh, is work with these creative series providers who a lot of the time are kind of best kept secrets in their industry. You know, they've been kind of hiding behind the scenes a little bit. They've been content to be um, in the backstage crew, so to speak. But at the juncture they're at when they reach me is they're looking around thinking, you know, I'm pretty good at this and I want to build or expand my existing brand so I can get more people, charm, do more exciting things and offer the things I really want to offer. Um, and it's just fantastic. I've been able to work with people as far from as, as close as up the street and as far away as, you know, the Philippines and Australia. Um, and it's really been such a gift to do this work because I've been in the industry for 10, uh, over 10 years now. I started out as a copywriter, did that for a big chunk of time, uh, and then actually retired last year to pursue this work full time because strategy and branding and uh, helping awesome people who are fantastic at their jobs make a lot of money is kind of my favorite sport. So I feel really lucky to get to do that every day. <laughs> That's amazing. So can you tell us more about um, the process that uh, went in, in transitioning from working for business to actually running your own business? Oh, absolutely. So that actually happened ago. So I, in terms of like, we're doing client work versus doing yeah, consulting so, or my jump into freelance. Right. Or my jump into freelance in general. Yeah, so uh, both of them, but but more so, I'm, I'm curious about um, just the 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 thought process that went in into the transitioning, um, perhaps even like the emotions that went on, because it, it can be scary Ooh. for a lot of people that you know run their own yeah. show when they're transitioning. Yeah, because there's so much uncertainty and so and especially yes. at a time when you're doing it in the middle of a pandemic i don't know if it's you did it in the middle of a pandemic. what it, a pan what <laughs> yeah and so it's it's i'm just fascinated by like how people were able to um you know cling in cling on to their their you know their their aspiration and, and hope yeah and yeah and, that's and transition and and hope that things you know um uh, would be fine. And so, and, and it sounds like things are great going on in your world. Jump and the net will appear as they say. Um, but <laughs> I think, so uh, I'll just real quick, I got my start in the online industry in 2011. 
um, because I was working in PR and communications. Didn't love that. Was always a writer and discovered copywriting and kind of one, th one thing led to another. Um, but I'm so glad you asked about this transition because um, I figured out years before I actually made the jump that I was kind of ready to move out of copywriting um, and into that that sort of the strategy and branding and, and creative direction and, and coaching was more where my heart was. But, but what was real tricky is that I had made a really good name for myself in the copywriting space. I was very well known. I spoke at events. Um, I was definitely a face in the industry. I had mentored a lot of other copywriters and, and supported a lot of other copywriters as well. Um, and it was really somewhere that I had a lot of clout and a lot of really solid standing and making a sideways step into a related but totally different industry where I had no clout <laughs> and no one really knew about this work that I was doing. Um, Jesus out of me, to be totally honest. So I had the realization about three years, so like 2017. I had the realization, I was like, man, I think I'm ready to step out of, be ready to step out of copywriting by the by, because I think I can do so more and offer so much more on the strategy side, on like the big picture side. Um, because one thing that's wonderful about being a copywriter is that you kind of get to sit inside the engine room of all of these ships, um, of all all of these businesses doing these incredible things. Um, I did a lot of work in the personal development sphere, the creative sphere, did a lot of work in SaaS and tech. And it was just a real joy to see how all these other companies operated and how all these different kinds of approaches. Um, so I had been doing a lot of strategy work as a lot of copywriters do kind of accidentally along the way, because I'd sit down and, and start working with a client, looking at the offers at what was on their site and noticing little things like, okay, I see that you're doing this. If you want to do X, you got to do Y and kind of helping them fill in those blanks. So by the time 2017 hit, I was like, you know, I'm doing a lot more of the strategy work than I'm getting paid for. So I really should consider transitioning. And it was really such a joy for me to be able to put those pieces together for people and watch them work. Um, so that was, that was something where I, I started realizing, I think it might be time to go, but, uh, I was so scared. I was like, no, I'm going to wait to make the leap until everything is exactly right and exactly in place. So I ended up spending years of my life and tens of thousands of dollars getting certifications and like testing offers behind the scenes and working with people one-on-one. -on -one. And I was kind of living a double life where I was doing my copywriting um, from my clients, but they didn't know I was also doing this coaching and creative direction on the side because I have a concept. I need to make sure my systems work. I need to make sure I'm even supposed to be doing that before I kind of take this running jump out of this industry that served me so well and, and kind of made me so much money. Um, and so the irony of all of this is that I was supposed to go public with the transition um, into what I do now in let's say like April of 2020. And in March, I had finally finished up all my certifications. I had like done a new photo shoot. We were getting ready for the big reveal and the world stops. Right. Um, and the bottom really fell out of the marketing and advertising industry for a minute because everything was frozen. And what's the first thing to go when companies aren't sure what's going to be happening financially over the next you know, six months to a year? Everyone pauses their advertising budgets and their branding efforts. So my whole industry, we were all kind of looking at each other like, <laughs> and I was so mad. I just remember being angry from the top of my head to the tips of my toes, aside from the fact things were terrible and you know, all these horrible things were unfolding all over the world. I was so mad because I was like, I did all this work to line this up perfectly. I did my due diligence. I planned, I set up all the pieces. They were ready to be knocked down and then whoosh, global pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so I retracted any sort of possible, I, I, for a while, for a couple of months, I was like, okay, looks like I'm just going to be a copywriter for another year while I figure this out. Um, so I took on some, I like opened up my client roster again, took on a few more projects and then about probably halfway through the end of May, start of June of last year. Now I was taking on another copywriting project and I was like, you know what, you, you know, I think I'm just done. I think I'm just going to finish. Like everything's I've set up is sitting over here. And at this point it's a global pandemic. Things can't possibly get much worse. So let me just 
just would say damn the torpedoes and just go for it because i'm not going to stay miserable here in the thick of this d- global disaster that's happening making myself even more miserable when i know i would at the very least be happier um trying to build this new side of things um mm-hmm. even though it might be take a financial hit like we're secure i can do this so i decided to make the jump and so it was in, uh, I made the announcement in June and in July, I had like a little retirement party um, on Zoom <laughs> where I sent some people who were really close to me gifts um, and like earrings and stuff, like thanking everyone for their participation over the years. And we had a Zoom call where I had three of sort of my favorite mentors on and talking about the transition and about change and about kind of making bold moves. And then I uh, finished up my last copy project and rode off into the sunset. Um, and what's been really incredible is that it has like it was such you could not have picked a worse time to make such a transition i think but the end result was actually really incredible we doubled just about doubled our revenue um last year and we're on track to do it again this year um as of last month we did more in sales than we had made in all of 2020 and that was a record year for us too uh prior to a good a real pretty good year before that so we're feeling i'm feeling really good about the transition and um, the satisfaction in knowing I'm doing the work that can help more people on a broader scale, um, the work that I'm supposed to be doing, the work that makes me feel good and, and gets me excited to just show up and sit at my desk every Monday. There's nothing like it. Um, and it was just such, but it was such a lesson in life is what happens when you're making other plans. Cause I was like, <laughs> I did this one by the book and then out of nowhere, COVID. Um, but it was it was a really remarkable learning experience and, and something I also share with my clients because so many of them um, in their work with me are transitioning, if not entirely out of their existing industries, but into different ways of working and charging and, and seeing themselves um, and being able to, I, I, they sort of watch that transition happen as well. Um, and I just have so many stories at this point and so many um, insights for them that, that help give them the courage to take the leaps themselves. Uh, which feels really good. So I may have wasted three years of my time gearing up for something that I ended up doing <laughs> in a fit of rage in a month anyway. Um, but it was a really, really, it was just a wonderful learning experience that when you bet on yourself and your head's in the right place about it, things tend to work out. That's amazing. Knock on wood. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope they continues to do so. Um... So of course the show is about purpose. Um, Mm -hmm. How has it served you throughout that time or maybe in other times in your life? Yeah, I, you know, what has been such an interesting, as a big part of my purpose is in really facilitating human connection, but also helping people see themselves. It's been something that I've done since I was a little, little kid. I don't know what if something about my face, but since I was very small, I could be sitting on a park bench and someone would sit down next to me and tell me their life. I just have one of those faces, one of those energies, I'm told. Um, and so I loved learning about people. I loved hearing their stories, but I also loved encouraging people. And when they would share with me, picking out these little remarkable moments that I spotted and celebrating it with them, because I don't think humans as a species, like, talk themselves up enough to each other and celebrate each other enough you know we're always wanting to talk about what's hard but when it comes to celebrating our achievements suddenly everybody gets shy um so being a writer and a creative as well was a way for me to share those observations and share those stories so when i wandered into the world of copywriting especially the the corner of the copywriting industry i was in uh, which is women led which is very creative which is very personal development very focused on you know empowerment and uplifting others Um, it was such a no brainer for me to step into a copywriting position because it utilized two of my most powerful skills, which are, which my purpose is as it were, which are writing, which is always so so naturally to me and has always brought me so much joy, but also seeing people and digging into what makes people special and what makes them unique and being able to not just reflect it back at them in a way that they understand, but be able to translate it in a way that everyone else can understand too. And that's what I'm still doing in my current work, just on a grander scale and in a more strategic way, because now it's not just 
developing, you know, finding out who you are, what makes you so special, what makes the way you do things so extraordinary, not just putting that on virtual paper, so to speak, or putting that into a messaging and content, but I'm helping them kind of see it and embody it in every aspect of their lives from the way they show up as a brand, from the way they design their offers uh, and create their offers and sell them, from the way that they show up in their content and realizing also that there are, what's wonderful about the internet is there's a million different ways to do things. So if you want to start building up your content strategy, you want to start showing up more, you don't have to be a writer you know, start a podcast, do a YouTube show, start doing Instagram stories. And I think reminding people that they can develop an approach to business and branding and, and showing up and selling and working that's a fit for the really awesome person that they are, um, is tailored to their likes and dislikes and their energy levels and the way they want to move through the world. It's just like, doing exactly encouraging a stranger on a park bench on a much bigger, bigger scale. Um, and it's just wonderful to see the stories that my clients have now, you know, going from barely crossing $2,000 a month to blowing up into 10 K 20 K 50 K, um, just by having a smarter approach to their offers and a better being more thoughtful about what they sell and also being able to talk themselves up more and own their genius. So that's a very uh, circumnavigated that answer. Um, but that's sort of how that all ties together. For me, my big part of my purpose has always been seeing people and showing them how amazing they are and then using that to create more of what they want. That's beautiful. And how does impact get into all of this? And uh, so this is actually something that I'm, oh shoot, hang on. Sorry, we just blew a fuse in the side of the house. We should be fine. Um, the, in terms of, sorry, we'll edit this out. Um, impact in terms of the impact I'm making on the larger world or the goal right. that I, the so, impact that I wanna make. Yeah, so as you're helping clients through your work and yeah. you're seeing positive results, what do you see are, are, are your, I guess one, what's what's your impact? Is it the yes. end result of generating revenue or is it more than that? And two, it's so much, it's so much more than that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really the first thing is confidence. Like across the board, that's what everybody tells me. You know, so but it's 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 not enough to say you're so great at this. What you have to help people do is believe it. Um, and especially working in a women's centered sphere, there's a lot of work that we <laughs> ladies need to do to start finally sort of believing these things that people tell us and these, these acknowledging our own talent and our own gifts and our own power. And for me, that's sort of where we start with my work and the coaching that I do is sort of we, we dig under the layers and we find out like what are these clients bringing to the table and everything that they do? What's so special? What is something that they do that nobody else does? Um, and helping them sort of see that and own it. And so confidence is the first piece. And second, what I'm one thing I'm really proud of is helping them discover that they can, as I mentioned, build their business around the type of person that they are. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that there's a big misconception that if you want to make more money, you have to work harder right? It's more hours. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's the key. When it's not, especially in the online business space, when we can develop packages and develop an approach to work that suits our needs. Um, there are so many different styles of offers, so many different ways that you can do your job. For example, I had a client who was a VA for many years um, and was not loving being on call for her clients all the time. Um, and basically wanted to get out of that game because it was just her slack was pinging constantly and she was on the other side of the world with a 12 hour time difference. So she'd wake up at like 2 a.m. to a string of messages, you know, heart palpitations, all those things. So I helped her develop an offer where she basically reframed herself as a tech and automation strategist. So she was building these big automations, these big platforms for people who were running higher end courses and programs and who were um, serving these larger and larger audiences so that she could one, get in for two weeks, get her job done and then get out. And two, um, supplement and replace the income that she was making with her virtual assistant retainers which was well, uh, basically a set of retainers. Whereas with one or two clients a month, she could make the same, if not more, and have a lot more peace um, and be a lot um, and sort of have the lifestyle that she wants in a lot of white space and free time. Cause she has a really wonderful son and a, a beautiful family and she wanted to spend more time with them. So that's sort of what we set her up to do. 
Um, and I helping like the confidence is one thing, but owning that this is the way I want to do business. Let me try it. Um, because everything, everything in business is an experiment as well. So, you know, if my client had tried that offer and if it hadn't worked, no problem. We're resilient. We move on to something else. Um, and it's also, so it's also teaching that lesson where it's like, you are so gifted. You are so talented. Here's how we own this. And also you have the right to work the way that you want to work. And we're going to test that till it works. Right. On, this kid doesn't that understand doors. Doesn't Give me one. I'm so sorry. My mic's picking it up. I know. Hang on. <laughs> She gets upset. Sorry. That's Dolly Purton. That's Miss Dolly Purton uh, on the decks there. So I well, apologize. Sure I can repeat that. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I think okay. to be able to capture just the beautiful moments of people having pets and uh, the relationship that they have with pets is beautiful. So thanks for, uh, for sharing that insight. Um, so that's great. I, I love the fact that you're seeing it impact as not just um, of course, generating revenue, which is important for the business, but also mm -hmm. helping people change their internal workings, whether they're yeah. on their skills or their mindset or um, or something internal that 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 only they themselves can control and manage. And so, mm -hmm. um, so the with with all of this work, when you're looking at at it from an outside perspective, like what really drives you or, or inspires you to do this work? I mean, of course we have passion and interest, but what, what's the reason behind it? For me, I think it's, it's partly because the online business world is still in so many ways, the wild west. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's still in its current form. It's only been sort of in this format and at this growth level for maybe the last 10, 15 years. Um, so there's so much new and so much to discover and so much that you can test and try and experiment with in the space. And I am a little bit, I like to say I have a puzzle solver brain, um, where I like to see problems and say, okay, is there a better way to get there? Okay. We want this. We want to be here and we're here. What are the steps that are going to be the easiest and make mo the most sense for the person in front of me? They're going to help them build that momentum and get where they want to go. Um, and I think that because when I started, it was in an era of the online business world where you like couldn't throw a rock and hit like a six steps to six figures online business course. They just weren't really around all that much uh, back in the day. And so for me, I had to be scrappy and I had to test everything. I also refused to get support and get a coach for a number of years because <clears throat> I'm very sort of self, very, I like to consider myself very, uh, what's the word for it? Um, Self-sufficient. And I was like, no, I can do it. I could have skipped a lot of mistakes if I just gotten support earlier, but whatever, that's in the past and we can't change it. Um, but for me, it was, I realized I didn't have a brain that worked in the traditional way that the traditional business world was supposed to work. So for example, my uh, content strategy, my, my blogging really helped me make a name for myself around like 20, between like 2015 and 2017. Um, I was writing a lot on my own blog, but before that I had not written anything because I was told as a copywriter, you are supposed to write this certain pillar content. So as a copywriter, you need to be talking about copy, only copy all the time, sales pages, about pages, you know, product descriptions, only focus on that. Um, and it bored me out of my gourd because I did that every day for work and I didn't want to write about that. Um, and it was also like, you should be writing weekly or every day. And, and that just felt really overwhelming to me. Um, and then one day I kind of got fed up and I gave myself permission to one, write about what I was thinking about and what mattered to me, whether those were observations from like growing up and how that sort of bled into the business world or talking about the industry as a whole or talking about the experience of creativity and entrepreneurship and, and how to support yourself and the observations and what I was seeing and testing. Talking about those things became my top priority, even if they weren't necessarily related to copywriting. Mm -hmm. um, and two, I realized that I wasn't gonna be writing a blog weekly because that's just not the way my brain works. So I actually committed myself to one blog a month and that was it. And that was enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish someone had told me that you can do it that way much earlier <laughs> um, because that was really helped me kind of get off the ground. 
Um, and so now when I sort of look at the industry and what drives me, I just want people to know that you don't necessarily have to do it the way everyone's telling you. Like if you, there's so many different ways to build momentum, to build that attention, to, to pursue your dream and the life that you want. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, but you need somebody who's going to roll up their sleeves, get down into the dirt with you and say, all right, where, where are we going and how do we build the bridge to get there? Um, and for my little puzzle, sol puzzle solving brain, there is no greater challenge um, mm -hmm. and no more joyful pursuit, I think. As I said, my favorite sport is helping awesome people make more money. But more than that, it's helping people really build these, these structures and strategies into their business that suit them. So they're much more likely to maintain momentum. They're much less likely to get discouraged and drop off. And they become, as I said, you know, resilient business owners where they know to test and try things. If something doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. We move on to the next thing and find what works for us. Wow, that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, your point. Um, there was a, an aspect in there that you mentioned, although that this journey is fun, um, there, there can be some challenges on, um, on the road ahead. And so I wanted to visit um, your, your, your notion implying that, that concept. Um, so with that said, how, does, how do you push through difficult times it's, it's sort of, there's this one saying, I forget who it's by, but it's her little, it's a, another writer online and her mantra is always today is not over yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the unique challenges of running your own business and, and being active in the online world is that you find it hard to disentangle your self-worth from mm -hmm. your work. Um, especially if you're a brand and you're the name of the brand and the face and people know you when you fall on your face and things get difficult, it feels much more personal. It feels like much more a reflection on you being a garbage person, aside from just the world of business being difficult, period, because it is. That's why if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the the most valuable way we can look at struggle is as data, as opposed to, again, a reflection that you are not worthwhile. And this is a really, and, and also to remember, as, as I mentioned today, it's not over yet, that you're getting data from even failures, not that you're not data that says you're a bad person, but that, hey, maybe this product wasn't a fit for the market, or maybe you don't have as many buyers as you thought in your audience. These are signs that can give us clues as to the next way to improve. Um, but the tricky part is when you're going through it, you're not just all of a sudden going to go full Dalai Lama and be like, you know what? It's just data. It feels personal and it feels bad. It feels bad to fail across the board. It just does. Um, but I think it's all always about learning to be with that feeling for a minute. You know, I, I, one of the big greatest lessons I learned over the years was not to turn around and say like, well, bing, put on a smile, we're going to get through this. It was to be willing to sit in that muck for however long, you know, 24, 48 hours a week to just like sit and feel bad for a second and then decide what to do next. Because you can tell somebody it's just data to the cows come home, but if it's a, a product you put so much labor and love into and it doesn't sell, you're like, well, this industry is terrible. I'm quitting. I'm terrible. My audience is terrible. We're no longer friends. This is it. Um, and it's, it's easy to kind of get sucked into the, that all or nothing romance. Um, but the act of running a business and the act of being a creative, running your own show, you cannot have the success without having the failure. They just don't go, they go together. They, there's no way of avoiding one without the other. Um, and I think that we need to normalize the ups and downs of business a little bit more because everyone talks about the successes. Everyone talks about the record months and the growth and the investors, but in the case of being in the day-to-day -day of their business and sort of running that marathon, you really need to just roll with the good and the bad and remember that if something didn't go well, that's okay. Once we dry our tears and we lick our wounds a little bit, we're gonna go to the data. We're gonna figure out what worked and what didn't and what didn't so we can do better next time. Um, and there's always a next time too. And the, the curse of online business is that you often have to sell something a few times before it really, really works, whether it's the way the product itself or the way you're selling it. So having that patience and having that self-compassion and self-understanding as you go through that process is so essential because it's going to happen. You're going to be let down. You're going to fail. You're going to be disappointed. But 
learning to be with that feeling and know that it's not the end mm -hmm. um, is so essential. I think it's an essential skill for business and I think it's an essential skill for life. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to revisit the, your, we, you touch it briefly on, on women in this space or just yes. like women leadership. And so, of course, as you know, a lot of brands are focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, being more yes. inclusive, and that especially involves developing the next generation of leaders in, in corporate America. And, and we're seeing a lot more emphasis on developing women to become next leaders. And so what's your, what's your take on all of that? Ooh, loaded question. Yes. Um, I think what's actually interesting is I feel as though my corner of the industry is at the forefront of developing um, female, because if, developing female leadership itself, like developing new models, essentially, mm -hmm. um, for women leaders. And the reason why I say that is that often when women climb the ladder in the corporate world, they're essentially just like the, they're, they're trained to kind of follow the same models that all of the men who came before them followed, which requires a different sort of cadence of leadership style. It, there was always sort of the masculine kind of paternalistic model, whereas women's quote unquote soft skills, which are, you know, essential, just as essential as the male leadership qualities that we put on this pedestal mm -hmm. uh, of empathy and compassion and communication and understanding. Um, they, I, I have been told this is why a lot of people end up in my industry because they climb the corporate ranks, they climb the ladder, and then they reach that that peak and they're like, man, there's still a dude's club up here. Like I might be a lady, but I don't know. It's grueling the amount of hours they're required to work, the, the way they're required to talk to their staff. So a lot of people tend to fall off and end up in my industry. Uh, a lot of these women, because there's a lot of opportunities for leadership. And this is where we're kind of experimenting with these new models in coaching and, and with the other things that we do, because what is very um, apparent right now is that for women, especially for women leaders themselves and for women becoming leaders, it's really important that we acknowledge that we've been socialized differently. Uh, and there are certain skills and that's not just uh, like women can do everything men can do, no doubt, but there are certain skills that women have that they're, they're asked to kind of strip away as they climb the corporate ladder, which to actually be nurtured and can make them better leaders and more effective. Um, in, in changing lives, leading teams, whatever it is that they look to do. So I think that it's incredibly, it's, I think it's overdue, um, commendable, but overdue that we're working on DEI, getting more, um, more women, more people of color in the, in the C-suite offices. I think that's absolutely essential. But what I'm a little concerned about, because again, this is where I see the drop off and the sort of the, the folks who float over into my industry is that they are, these folks are being welcomed in from all these different backgrounds and experiences, but they're being pushed into the same model that mm -hmm. these, all the traditional sort of white dude, boys club, corporate culture uh, is, came from. So I think that's really interesting. And it wouldn't surprise me over the next 10 years if we kind of see uh, a bit of a reckoning in how corporate leadership is, is developed and formed. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think, I agree with you that there needs to be uh, a different business model that would encourage and empower women and people of color to climb the corporate ladder um, in a way that serves them rather than hinders their abilities. Um, traditional business models never work, especially mm -hmm. when the market is constantly changing and there's always um, new demands from the communities and society. And what we're seeing through movements like the Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. um, you know the Me Too movement is that uh, they're demanding a change, and corporate leaders need to be aware of these movements and how that impacts the business. And so, um, I'm all for um, you know having new leadership and you know, new vision and new purpose. I think that businesses that thrive for you know, 10, 20, 30 years and plus are those that are cognizant of what's going on around them mm -hmm. and yeah. communities. Um, we can't have traditional business models that had worked 10, 20 years ago and apply it to today's um, de business demands. It just doesn't work, um, which is yeah, why absolutely. businesses failed um, yeah. to succeed. And so 
speaking of succeed and success successes, what are some of your um, success habits? Ooh, that's such a good question. Um, I think first of all, I prioritize this is the 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 personal well-being. Like for many, many years, mm-hmm. I really neglected my and I'm still not perfect. So I'll just put that out there right now. Um, well, but I neglected my <laughs> exactly. I'm a perfect saint of wellness. So <laughs> call me Gwen of the Paltrow. Um, but I for me, prioritizing my mental and physical health first. Um, has been such a big change. I think over the last three years, I've been working on that because I love, I love my work and I will get hyper-focused in what I'm doing for weeks at a stretch. And then I realized that like, whoops, I've been drinking every night and haven't been to the gym in a month. Oopsie. Um, but I find that when I prioritize my per- like mental and physical well-being, so I'm making sure I'm getting into the gym, I'm seeing my trainer, seeing my therapist, I'm seeing my coach. Yeah, I have a whole support team. Okay. Um, and I have to, and I make sure these things are locked in, especially because I'm in such a period of rapid growth right now. Like we want to do, I, I would say we want to do a million by 2022, and I think we're going to get there. Um, but the prioritizing those things and investing in those things first before I do any of the other business stuff has been probably the most counterintuitive, um, success <laughs> principle that I've come upon to date. Cause I remember I was like, I don't need a coach. I don't want to pay for a friend. And like, I have, I have people I can ask questions to if I need to. And like, why would I have a trainer? I can just go to the gym. And I was not going to the gym. Um, and I, you know, I get, I have food delivered. I have like healthy lunches delivered every week for the weekdays just to make sure I'm getting my nourishment. And it's been so fascinating to, to where I like every dollar I invest in my personal and mental well being, I see it pay dividends elsewhere in my business. So that's the first priority. Um, I'm also working on my phone addiction right now, which is another part of that physical and mental well-being. I think a lot of us have a lot of deep patterning to do after our phones were our only companions, <laughs> aside from our partners and kids for about a year. Um, and then, I, so that sort of prioritize your well-being first and the rest will follow. Um, and the second success principle is really knowing who to ask for advice from like, that's the other thing. Cause I found that when I was starting and when I was making a transition and I was scared, I was asking a lot of people for their opinions and a lot of people have a lot of different opinions. And so I ended up, that's the too many cooks in the kitchen problem, right? Where you have so much feedback and so much information from people that, you know, trust and respect that you're like, who's correct. Oh no. Oh God. Existential spiral. And then you just end up doing the thing you were planning on doing anyway. So for me, I have very specific people that I ask for, for advice. Um, and I, only, I usually also go when I know I'm going to take the advice too, because there's nothing more frustrating than having the same person come to you for advice again and again, and then never taking it. Um, but the, the third one is also always, always, always this resilience piece. Um, the third, probably biggest success principle is knowing that even if something is a failure, it just means we're failing forward. We are heading towards greater success. This is information. Um, And I think when I let go of my attachment to outcomes a little more, when it became so much less dire um, for me to hit a certain revenue goal, because it reached a point where I was making enough in my private practice, like in my coaching practice, that um, any products or something that I sold was gravy, you know, that was additional sort of income. And that was awesome, but it's, it didn't make it any easier. And I was any less scary. I was like, what's up with this? Like, I'm not relying on this to pay the bills, but I was making the numbers mean something about me as a human being. And this is where I talked about sort of that detangling the personal self from, from your like brand self and your work self. Um, so for me, it's just like building that failure resilience and that bounce back. Um, because every time I've just, I've taken a hit, I always come back stronger because I take the lessons. I learn them. I, I make edits and updates to whatever it is I was working on and we move forward and we give it, um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but we'll give it two or three, two or three attempts before we fully nix it. Um, and I think that, that, that knowledge, that failure is coming as opposed to, the constant trying attempts to hide from failure, uh, which I did for many years, which kept me sort of behind the scenes and the best kept secret and, you know, doing all these th- undercharging and doing all these things that kind of me, kept me stuck in place because I was so scared of taking swings and striking out. But you discover that that's not the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world is staying paralyzed exactly where you are and mm-hmm. committing yourself to a swamp of tedium and frustration and unhappiness. So 
pick yeah. your poison either way <laughs> either way you, it's, you the bad feelings will come it just matters which sort of bad feelings are coming your way and why and you get to choose yeah uh, you mentioned so many good points there but i wanted to um just really briefly touch on the point about like how failure can actually serve you good there's always learning opportunities yeah. for growth and to yep be in a position that stalls you or that you're feeling like your career is not going anywhere is actually more of a failure than it is a um, a, a sense of feeling safe because you're not growing. Mm -hmm. And as human beings, we have to grow in order to meet our purpose and yeah. fulfillment in our life. Because if we're not growing, yeah. then what's the whole point of life, right? And so- yep. um, yeah, those are great uh, um, insights to share. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with my listeners. Um, we're about that time. So I do want to um, um, uh, ask my, just two more questions. The next question here is what advice would you give um, to my listeners or folks listening to the show as it relates to purpose and meaning? Absolutely. I would say uh, my advice is two words and they are keep going. Like across the board, that is the advice I find myself giving just because when you're in pursuit of your purpose, when you are uh, experimenting and trying new things, when you are carving out a new path for yourself, it's going to get scary and it's going to get hard, but it's also, there's going to be so much beauty and self-discovery available along the way. So you keep putting one foot in front of the other. It's like running a race. If you feel tired, you slow down, but you don't stop keep going and i'm willing to bet there are so many beautiful things ahead for you wow that's uh incredible um i and i agree 100 we have to You're keep such going. a complimentary interviewer i love it thank you <laughs> i feel very profound today <laughs> you know i you've been around the block and you know a few things here and there so appreciate you leveraging your experiences and wisdom um and and where can people find you should they choose to connect Oh, yes. This is where I can put on my uh, radio announcer voice. So <laughs> <laughs> you can visit my web, hillaryweiss.com, www.h-i-l-l-a-r-y-w-e-i-s-s.com. Um, you can also find me on Instagram um, at hcweiss. So that's H is in hat, C as in cat, W-E-I-S-S. -S, and I am on Twitter at the same handle. Um, Instagram is where I spend most of my time. So if you're listening to this, if you want to say hello, please do. I love making new internet friends. Go ahead, add me on Instagram and shoot me a DM because I would love to know what your favorite takeaway was from this. Oh, if there's anything you agree with, disagree with, come say hi. I'd love to meet you. And Kong, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, such a pleasure having you on and having this conversation. Um, well, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this podcast episode and would love to connect with Hillary, please do so uh, through the contact information she mentioned and reference where you found her. And please do uh, subscribe to this channel and click, click the like button and share it with your friends and family. Hillary, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon.